quite a large hole, the sort of thing an animal about the size of a fox might have made. James knelt down in front of it and poked his head and shoulders inside. He crawled in. He kept on crawling. This isn't just a hole, he thought excitedly. It's a tunnel. The tunnel was damp and murky, and all around him was the curious, bittersweet smell of fresh peach. The floor was soggy under his knees. The walls were wet and sticky, and peach juice was dripping from the ceiling. James opened his mouth and caught some of it on his tongue. It tasted delicious. He was crawling uphill now, as though the tunnel were leading straight toward the very center of the gigantic fruit. Every few seconds, he paused and took a bite out of the wall. The peach flesh was sweet and juicy and marvelously refreshing. He crawled on for several more yards, and then suddenly, bang! The top of his head bumped into something extremely odd, blocking his way. Ow. He glanced up. In front of him, there was a solid wall that seemed at first as though it were made of wood. He touched it with his fingers. It certainly felt like wood, except that it was very jagged and full of deep grooves. Good heavens, he said. I know what this is. I've come to the stone in the middle of the peach. Then he noticed that there was a small door cut into the face of the peach stone. He gave a push. It swung open. He crawled through it, and before he had time to glance up and see where he was, he heard a voice saying, Which one is that? Look who's here! Ah! And another one that said, We've been waiting for you. <laughs> James stopped and stared at the speakers, his face white with horror. He started to stand up, but his knees were shaking so much he had to sit down again against the wall. He glanced behind him, thinking he could bolt back into the tunnel the way he had come, but the doorway had disappeared. There was now only a solid brown wall behind him. James' large, frightened eyes traveled slowly around the room. The creatures, some sitting on chairs, others reclining on a sofa, were all watching him intently. Creatures? Or were they insects? An insect is usually something rather small, is it not? A grasshopper, for example, is an insect. So what would you call it? if you saw a grasshopper as large as a dog, as large as a large dog. You could hardly call that an insect, could you? There was an old green grasshopper as large as a large dog sitting on a stool directly across the room from James now. And next to the old green grasshopper, there was an enormous spider. And next to the spider, there was a giant ladybug with nine black spots on her scarlet shell. Each of these three was squatting upon a magnificent chair. On a sofa nearby, recolliding comfortably in a curled up position, there was a centipede and an earthworm. On the floor over in the far corner, there was something thick and white that looked as though it might be a silkworm. But it was sleeping soundly and nobody was paying any attention to it. Every one of these creatures was at least as big as James himself. And in the strange greenish light that shone down from somewhere in the ceiling, they were absolutely terrifying to behold. I'm hungry. The spider announced suddenly, staring hard at James. I'm famished, the old green grasshopper said. Who am I? The ladybug cried. 
the centipede sat up a little straighter on the sofa. Everyone's famished. <laughs> he said. We need food. Four pairs of round black glassy eyes were all fixed upon James. The centipede made a wiggling movement with his body <laughs> as though he were about to glide off the sofa. But he didn't. There was a long pause and a long silence. The spider, who happened to be a female spider, opened her mouth and ran a long black tongue delicately over her lips. Aren't you hungry? She asked suddenly, leaning forward and addressing herself to James. Poor James was backed up against the far wall, shivering with fright, and much too terrified to answer. What's the matter with you? The old green grasshopper asked. You look positively ill. He looks as though he's gonna faint any second. The centipede said. Oh my goodness, the poor thing. The ladybug cried. I do believe he thinks it's him that we're wanting to eat. <laughs> there was a roar of laughter from all sides. Yes. Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> what an awful thought. An awful thought. Awful thought. <laughs> you mustn't be frightened. The ladybug said kindly. We wouldn't dream of hurting you. You're a one of us now. Didn't you know that? You're one of the crew. Uh, we're all in the same boat. We've been waiting for you all day long. The old green grasshopper said. We thought you were never going to turn up. I'm glad you made it. So cheer up, my boy. Cheer up. The centipede said. And meanwhile, we should come over here and give me a hand with all these boots. Takes me hours to get them all off by myself. <laughs> James decided that this was most certainly not a time to be disagreeable. So he crossed the room to where the centipede was sitting and knelt down beside him. Thank you so much. The centipede said. You are very kind. <laughs> you have a lot of boots. I got a lot of legs. The centipede answered proudly. <laughs> and a lot of feet, 100 to be exact. There he goes again. The earthworm cried, speaking for the first time. He simply cannot stop telling lies about his legs. He doesn't even have anything like 100 of them. He's only got 42. The trouble is that most people don't bother to count them. They just take his word. And anyway, there's nothing marvelous, you know, centipede, about having a lot of legs. Oh, hello. The centipede said, whispering in James's air. He's blind. He can't see how splendid I look. In my opinion, the earthworm said, the really marvelous thing is to have no legs at all and to be able to walk just the same. You call that walking? cried the centipede. You're a slitherer. That's all you are. You just slither along. I glide, said the earthworm primely. You are a slimy beef, answered the centipede. I am not a slimy beast, the earthworm said. I am a useful and much-loved creature. Ask any gardener you'd like. And as far as you... I'm a pest. The centipede announced, grinning broadly and looking around the room for approval. He is so proud of that. The ladybug said, smiling at James. Though for the life of me, I can't understand why. I'm the only pest in this room! Cried the centipede. Still grinning away. Unless you count old green grasshopper over there, but he's long past it now. He's too old to be a pest anymore. The old green grasshopper turned his eyes, his huge black eyes, upon the centipede and gave him a withering look. Young fellow, he said, speaking in a deep, slow, scornful voice. 
I have never been a pest in my life. I am a musician. Oh, hear, hear, <laughs> said the ladybug. James, the centipede said. Your name is James, isn't it? <coughs> yes. Well, James, given your life seen such a marvelous, colossal centipede as me? I certainly haven't. James answered. How on earth did you get to be like that? Very peculiar, the centipede said. Very, very peculiar, indeed. Let me tell you what happened. I was messing about in the garden under the old peach tree, and suddenly a funny little green thing came wriggling past my nose. Bright green it was, extraordinarily beautiful. It looked like some kind of tiny stone or crystal. Oh, but I know what that was, cried James. It happened to me too, said the ladybug. Me, Miss Spider said. Suddenly there were these little green things everywhere. The soil was full of them. I actually swallowed one, the earthworm declared proudly. So did I, the ladybug said. I swallowed three, the centipede cried. But who's telling this story anyway? Don't interrupt. It's too late to tell us stories now, the old green grasshopper announced. It's time to go to sleep. I refuse to sleep in my boots, the centipede cried. How many more are there to come off, James? I, I think I've done about 20 so far. James told him. Then that leaves 80 to go. The centipede said. 22, not 80, shrieked the earthworm. He's lying again. <laughs> the centipede roared with laughter. Oh, stop pulling the earthworm's leg, the ladybug said. <laughs> this sent the cat, the centipede, into hysterics. <laughs> Pulling his leg! <laughs> he cried, wriggling with glee and pointing at the earthworm. Which leg am I pulling? <laughs> you tell me that! James decided that he rather liked the centipede. He was obviously a rascal, but what a change it was to hear somebody laughing once in a while. He had never heard Aunt Sponge or Aunt Spiker laughing aloud in all of the time he had been with them. We really must get some sleep, the old green grasshopper said. We've got a tough day ahead of us tomorrow, so would you be kind enough, Miss Spider, to make the beds? A few minutes later, Miss Spider had made the first bed. It was hanging from the ceiling suspended by a rope of threads at either end so that it actually looked more like a hammock than a bed. But it was a magnificent affair, and the stuff that it was made of shimmered like silk in the pale light. I do hope you'll find it comfortable, Miss Spider said to the old green it. grasshopper. I made it as soft and silky as I possibly could. I spun it with gossamer. That's as much better quality thread than the one I use for my own web. Thank you so much, my dear lady, the old green grasshopper said, climbing into the hammock. Ah, this is just what I needed. Good night, everybody. Good night. Then Miss Spider spun the next hammock, and the ladybug got in. And after that, she spun a long one for the centipede, and an even longer one for the earthworm. And how do you like your bed? She said to James when it came to be his turn. Hard or soft? I like it soft. Thank you very much. James answered. For goodness sake, stop to stand around the room and get out of my boots. The centipede said. You and I are never going to get any sleep at this rate. And kindly line them up neatly in pairs as you take them off. Don't just throw them over your shoulder. Hello? Dad? You. Oh, you went off. Shit. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's James, James worked. Are we ready? Is it good?
Yeah, yeah we're good. You're back. Okay. Uh, James worked frantically on the centipede's boots. Each one had laces that had to be untied and loosened before it could be pulled off. And to make matters worse, all the laces were tied up in the most complicated knots that had to be unpicked with fingernails. It was just awful. It took about two hours, and by the time James had pulled off the last boot of all had the last boot of all had lined them up in a row on the floor. Twenty one pairs altogether. The centipede was fast asleep. Wake up, centipede whispered James, giving him a gentle dig in the stomach. It's time for bed. Thank you, my dear child, the centipede said, opening his eyes. Then he got down off the sofa and ambled across the room and crawled up into his hammock. James got into his own hammock, and oh, how soft and comfortable it was compared with the hard, bare boards that his aunts had always made him sleep upon at home. Lights out, said the centipede drowsily. Nothing happened. Turn off the light, he called, raising his voice. James glanced around the room, wondering which of the others he might be talking to. But they were all asleep. The old green grasshopper was snoring loudly through his nose. The ladybug was making whistling noises as she breathed. And the earthworm was coiled up like a spring at one end of his hammock, wheezing and blowing through his open mouth. As for Miss Spider, she had made a lovely web for herself across one corner of the room, and James could see her crouching in the very center of it, mumbling softly in her dreams. I said turn off the light! shouted the centipede angrily. Are you talking to me? James asked him. Corp, I'm not talking to you, you ass! The centipede answered. That crazy glowworm is gonna sleep with a light on! For the first time since entering the room, James glanced up at the ceiling, and there he saw a most extraordinary sight. Something that looked like a gigantic fly without wings. It was at least three feet long, was standing laying upside down upon its six legs in the middle of the ceiling, and the tail end of this creature seemed to be literally on fire. A brilliant greenish light, as bright as the brightest electric bulb, was shining out of its tail and lighting up the whole room. Is that a glowworm? Asked James, staring at the light. It doesn't look like any sort of worm to me. Of course it's a glowworm. The centipede answered. At least that's what she calls herself. Oh, actually, you are quite right. She's not a worm at all. Glow worms are never worms. They're simply lady fireflies without wings. Wake up, you lazy bee! But the glow worm didn't stir, so the centipede reached out of his hammock and picked up one of his boots from the floor. Put out that wretched light! He shouted, hurling the boot up at the ceiling. The glow worm slowly opened one eye and stared at the centipede. There is no need to be rude, she said coldly. All in good time. Come on, come on, come on, <laughs> shouted the centipede. I'll put it out for you. Oh, hello, James. The glowworm said, looking down and giving James a little wave and a smile. I didn't see you come in. Welcome, my dear boy. Welcome, and good night. Then click, and out went the light. James Henry Trotter lied there in the darkness, with his eyes wide open, listening to the strange sleeping noises that the creatures were making all around him, and wondering what on earth was going to happen to him in the morning. Already he was beginning to feel like his new already he was beginning to like his new friends very much. They were not nearly as terrible as they looked. In fact, they weren't really terrible at all. They seemed extremely kind 
and helpful, in spite of all the shouting and arguing that went on between them. Good night, old green grasshopper, he whispered. Good night, ladybug. Good night, Miss Spider. But before he could go through them all, he had fallen fast asleep. <clears throat> We're off! Someone was shouting. We're off at last! James woke up with a jump and looked about him. The creatures were all out of their hammocks and moving excitedly around the room. Suddenly, the floor gave a great heave, as though an earthquake were taking place. Here we go! Shouted the old green grasshopper, uh, hopping up and down with excitement. Hold on tight! What's happening? Cried James, leaping out of his hammock. What's going on? The ladybug, who was obviously a kind and gentle creature, came over and stood beside him. In case you don't know it, she said, oh. We are about, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, we are about to depart forever from the top of this ghastly hill that we've all been living on for so long. Uh, we are about to roll away inside this great, big, beautiful peach to a land of, um, um, to, to a, a land. Um, of what? Asked James. Never you mind. <laughs> said the ladybug. But nothing could be worse than this desolate hilltop and those two repulsive aunts of yours. Here, 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 here. You may not have noticed it, the ladybug went on. But the whole garden, even before it reaches the steep edge of the hill, happens to be on a steep slope. And, and therefore, the only thing that has been stopping this peach from rolling away right from the beginning is the thick stem attaching it to the tree. Break the stem, and uh, off we go. Watch it, cried Miss Spider, as the room became another violent lurch. Here we go. Not quite, uh, not quite. At this moment, continued the ladybug, our centipede, who has a pair of jaws as sharp as razors, is up there on the top of the peach, nibbling away at that stem. In fact, he must be nearly through it, as you can tell from the way we're latching about. Would you like me to take you under my wings so that you won't fall over when we start rolling? That's very kind of you, said James. But I think I'll be all right. Just then, the centipede stuck his grinning face through a hole in the ceiling and shouted, I've done it! We're off! We're off! We're off! We're off! We're off! The journey begins! <laughs> and who knows shouted, where shouted where the centipede. <laughs> and who knows where it will end? Muttered the earthworm. If you have anything to do with it, it can only mean trouble. Nonsense, said the ladybug. We are now about to visit the most marvellous places and see the most wonderful things. Isn't that so, Centipede? There's no knowing what we'll see, cried the Centipede. We may see a creature with 49 heads who lives in the desolate snow. And whether, whenever he catches a cold, which he dreads, he has 49 noses to blow. We may see the venomous pink-spotted scrunch who can chew up a man in one bite. It likes to eat five of them roasted for lunch and 18 for its supper at night. We may see a dragon, and nobody knows that we won't see a unicorn there. We may see a terrible monster with toes growing out of the tufts of his hair. We may see the sweet little bitty bright head so playful, so kind, and well-bred, and such beautiful eggs. You just boil them, and then they explode, and they blow off your head. A gnu and a gnoceros, surely you'll see, and that gnormous and gnarable gnat, whose sting, when it stings you, goes in at the knee and then comes out through the top of your hat. We may even get lost and be frozen by frost. We may die in an earthquake or tremor. 
or nastier still, we may even be tossed on the horns of a furious dilemma. But who cares? Let us go from this horrible hill. Let us roll, let us bowl, let us plunge. Let's go rolling and bowling and spinning until we're away from old Spiker and Sponge. One second later, slowly, insidiously, almost gently, the great peach started to lean forward and steal into motion. The whole room began to tilt over, and all of the furniture went sliding across the floor and crashed against the far wall. So did James and the ladybug, and the old green grasshopper, and Miss Spider, and the earthworm, and also the centipede, who had just come slithering quickly down the wall. Outside of the garden, at that very moment, Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker had just taken their places at the front gate, each with a bunch of tickets in her hand, and the first stream of early morning sightseers was visible in the distance, climbing up the hill to view the peach. We shall make a fortune today, Aunt Spiker was saying. Just look at all those people. I wonder what became of that horrid little boy of ours last night. Aunt Sponge said. He never did come back, did he? Probably fell down in the dark and broke his leg. Aunt Spiker said. Or his neck, maybe. Aunt Sponge said hopefully. Just wait till I get my hands on him. Aunt Spiker said, waving her cane. He'll never want to stay out all night again by the time I've finished with him. Good gracious me, what's that awful noise? Both women swung around to look. The noise, of course, had been caused by the giant peach crashing through the fence that surrounded it. And now, gathering speed every second, it came rolling across the garden toward the place where Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker were standing. They gaped, they screamed, ah! they started to run. They panicked. They both got in each other's way. They began pushing and jostling, and each of them was thinking only about saving herself. Aunt Sponge, the fat one, ripped, tripped up and tripped over a box that she'd brought along to keep the money in, and fell flat on her face. Aunt Spiker immediately tripped over Aunt Sponge and came down on top of her. They both lay on the ground, fighting and clawing and yelling and struggling frantically to get up again. But before they could do this, the mighty peach was upon them. There was a crunch, and then there was silence. The peach rolled on, and behind it, Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker lay ironed out upon the grass as flat and thin and lifeless as a couple of paper dolls cut out of a picture book. And now that the peach had broken out of the garden and was over the edge of the hill, rolling and bouncing down the steep slope at a terrific pace, faster and faster and faster it went, and the crowds of people who were climbing up the hill suddenly caught sight of this terrible monster plunging down upon them, and they screamed and scattered to right and left as it went hurtling by. At the bottom of the hill, it charged across the road, knocking over a telegraph pole and flattening two parked automobiles as it went by. Then it rushed madly across about twenty fields, breaking down all fences and hedges in its path. It went right through the middle of a herd of fine Jersey crows, and then through a flock of sheep, and then through a paddock of horses, and then through a full yard of pigs, and soon the whole countryside was a seething mass of panic-stricken animals stampeding in all directions. The peach was still going at a tremendous speed, with no sign of slowing down, and about a mile further on, it came down to a village. 
Down the main street of the village, it rolled, with people leaping frantically out of its path, left and right, right and left, and at the end of the street, it went crashing down right through the wall of an enormous building, and out the other side, leaving two gaping round holes in the brickwork. This building happened to be a famous factory where they made chocolate, and almost at once a great river of warm, melted chocolate came pouring out of the holes of the factory wall. A minute later, this brown, sticky mess was flowing through every street in the village, oozing under the doors of houses and into people's shops and gardens. Children were wading in it up to their knees, and some were even trying to swim in it. And all of them were sucking it into their mouths in great greedy gulps and shrieking with joy. But the peach rolled on across the countryside, on and on and on, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. Cowsheds, stables, pigsties, barns, bungalows, hayricks, anything that got in its way went toppling over like a ninepin. An old man sitting quietly beside a stream had his fishing rod whisked out of his hands as it went dashing by. And a woman called Daisy Edwhistle was standing so close to it as it passed that she had the skin taken off of the tip of her nose. Would it ever stop? Why should it? A round object will always keep on rolling as long as it is on a downhill slope. And in this case, the land sloped downhill all the way until it reached the ocean. The same ocean that James had begged his aunts to be allowed to visit the day before. Well, perhaps he was going to visit it now. The peach was rushing closer and closer to it every second, and closer also to the towering white cliffs that came first. These cliffs are the most famous in the whole of England and they are hundreds of feet high. Below them, the sea is deep and cold and hungry. Many ships have been swallowed up and lost forever on this part of the coast, and all the men who were in them as well. The peach was now only a hundred yards away from the cliff, now fifty, now twenty, now ten, now five, and when it reached the edge of the cliff, it seemed to leap up onto the sky and hang there, suspended for a few seconds, still turning over and over in the air. Then it began to fall, down, 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 smack! It hit the water with a colossal smack splash and sank like a stone. But a few seconds later, it came up again, and this time up it stayed, floating serenely upon the surface of the water. Can we take a break <laughs> before I read one? Um, I think we could do one more chapter. One more chapter. Is the next one short? I just feel bad because Anthony needs to eat. It's only a couple pages. Isn't it's it? quite fine. <laughs> we'll call it oh, minute. God! He's back! <laughs> Audrey, I really appreciate your costume change to, I don't know what character that is, but ice cream man, <laughs> question mark. Should I read one more chapter? Yeah, we'll let's take a break. All right. And then we'll yeah. Oh, I splashed a little water on myself. It was not a wise decision. Okay, ready? In my class. Yeah. Rather than tumbling down a hill and landing in the ocean. Ocean man, take me by the hand. All right. Ugh. All right, chapter 17. Ready? At this moment, the scene inside the peach itself was one of indescribable chaos. Henry, oh shit, let me start that over again. Can you edit this, by the way? Yeah. No? This is impossible to edit? It's just gonna be uh, it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me start over that chapter.
<laughs> Unedited I, and raw. Yeah, More right. innuendos. <laughs> At this moment, the scene inside the peach itself was one of indescribable chaos. James Henry Trotter was lying bruised and battered on the floor of the room amongst a tangled mass of centipede and earthworm and spider and ladybug and glowworm and old green grasshopper. In the whole history of the world, no travelers had ever a more terrible journey than these unfortunate creatures. It had started out well, with much laughing and shouting, and for the first few seconds, as the peach had began to slow, slowly roll forward, nobody had minded being tumbled about a bit. And when it went bump, and the centipede had shouted, That was on Sponge! And then bump again, That was on Spiker! There had been a tremendous burst of cheering all around. Yeah. But as soon as... But as soon as the peach rolled out of the garden and began to go down the steep hill, rushing and plunging and bounding madly downward, then the whole thing became a nightmare. James found himself being flung up against the ceiling, then back up on the floor, then sideways against the wall, then up upon to the ceiling again, then up and down and back and forth and round and round and at the same time, all of the other creatures were flying through the air and in every direction, and so were the chairs and the sofa, not to mention the 42 boots belonging to the centipede. Everything, everything and all of them were being rattled around inside like peas inside an enormous rattle that was being rattled by a mad giant who refused to stop. To make it worse, something went wrong with the glowworm's lighting system, and the room was in pitchy darkness. There were screams and yells and curses and cries of pain, and everything kept going round and round, and ah. once James made a frantic grab at some thick bars sticking out of the wall, only to find that they were a couple of the centipede's legs. I know you idiot! Right shouted the centipede, kicking herself free, and James was promptly flung across the room into the old green grasshopper's horny lap. Twice he got tangled up in Miss Spider's legs, a horrid business, and toward the end, the poor earthworm, who was cracking himself like a whip every time he flew through the air from one side of the room to the other, coiled himself around James's body in a panic and refused to unwind. Oh, it was a frantic and terrible trip. But it was all over now, and the room was suddenly very still and quiet. Everybody was beginning slowly and painfully to disentangle himself from everybody else. Let's have some light! shouted the centipede. Yes! They cried. Let's give us some light! light. I'm trying, answered the poor glowworm. I'm doing my best. Please be patient. They all waited in silence. Then a faint greenish light began to glimmer out of the glowworm's tail, and this gradually became stronger and stronger until it was anyway enough to see by. Oh, some great journey, the centipede said, limping across the room. I shall never be the same again, muttered the earthworm. Nor I, said the ladybug. It's taken years off my life. But my dear friends, cried the old green grasshopper, trying to be cheerful. We are there. Where? 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 Where is there? I don't know, <clears throat> the old green grasshopper said. But I'll bet it's somewhere good. We're probably at the bottom of a coal mine, the earthworm said gloomily. We certainly went down and down and down very suddenly at the last moment. 
<laughs> I felt it in my stomach. I still feel it. Perhaps we're in the middle of a beautiful country full of songs and music. The old green grasshopper said. On near the seashore, said James eagerly. With lots of other children down on the sand to come and to, for, uh, for me to play with. Pardon me, murmured the ladybug, turning a trifle pale. Um, but am I wrong to, th to think that we seem to be bobbing up and down? Bobbing up and down? Up and down? They cried. What on earth do you earth mean? What on earth do you mean? What on earth do you mean? You're still giddy from the journey, the old green grasshopper told her. You'll get over it in a minute. Is everybody ready to go upstairs and now and take a look round? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, right. Come on, let's go. Oh, come on, let's go. I refuse to show myself out of doors in my bare feet. The centipede said. I have got to get my boots on again. For heaven's sake, let's not th go through that nonsense again. The earthworm said. Let's all lend the centipede a hand, literally, to get it over with. <laughs> the ladybug said. Come on. So they did, all except Miss Spider, who set about weaving a long rope ladder that would reach from the floor up to a hole in the ceiling. The old green grasshopper had wisely said that they must not risk going outside the entrance when they didn't know where they were, but must first all go up onto the top of the peach and have a look around. So, half an hour later, when the rope ladder had been finished and hung and the 42nd boot had been laced neatly onto the centipede's 42nd foot, they were all ready to go out. Amidst mounting excitement and shouts of, here we go, boys. The promised land. We can't, can't wait, wait to see it. Can't wait. The whole, the whole company climbed up the ladder one by one and disappeared into the soggy tunnel in the ceiling that went steeply, almost vertically upward. Hey! Yay, we did it. We did 17. <laughs> All right. Um, I have a... A light oh, now in Anthony my room can eat <laughs> that I can make green, but I like dropped the remote as we were recording, so I couldn't do it. And I was like, uh. so I will oh. do that next time. Oh. <laughs>